Welcome back to r slash neighbors from hell, where people share stories about their crazy neighbors. And if you are new to my channel, please don't forget to subscribe to join our amazing community. And without any further ado, let's dive right into the stories. The first one is titled, Neighbor built an illegal trailer park on my property. I busted their drug operation and got them arrested. I moved after deciding that the cramped city style was not for me and was not how I wanted to raise my family. I got back to my roots and got a nice cozy house in a more rural area. We did not have a huge farm or anything but enough land that we could plant a garden and have a chicken coop. I even helped create the blueprints for the house myself as an amateur architect, under the supervision of a professional of course, and my dream home was born. Unfortunately, there was one problem with the new place where we were living, as it was a huge one, which was our neighbors. Now, like I said before, before I came from a big city, so having annoying neighbors is not exactly new for me, I can put up with a lot and learn to just deal with it. These neighbors, however, went way over the line and caused problems that I did not even know how to begin fixing. At first I noticed right away that their side of the property was disgusting with trash everywhere. It was their land though and I really wanted to just mind my own business. You could tell pretty quickly that these people were not the savory members of society and something like trash was not enough to make me want to fight them. Then we started noticing people camping out, for lack of better term, on my own property. It was a bunch of RVs and people in tents that just started parking pretty much on the line between the neighbors and my property. So now my property had RVs on it and more people making a mess and causing noise. They were starting to cook fires and making noise all hours of the night and day. They would also come and go, having their bright lights flashing into my house and waking me up. Honestly, people coming onto my property and making a mess of things was past my line and I knew I had to do something about this. Still, I got a bad feeling about the neighbor and I did not feel comfortable confronting them directly. It turns out, I have a pretty good gut feeling for these things. I call the police and find out that the neighbors have been around the block a couple of times and have even been in and out of jail for a few different types of charges. As for the property issue though, they said that they could not help directly and I would need to get the state involved. So I called them and they wanted to label it as a case of squatting, it really wasn't, and that they were overrun and would not be able to get anyone out there for months. I understand things are backed up, but I was not going to wait months when who knows what kind of damage they were going to do. I even caught one of these guys trying to get into the gated area we keep the chickens in and steal one. I ran outside holding my shotgun and he quickly ran back into his RV. I was not going to shoot him and it was not loaded, it was just an easy way I found to scare them from getting too close to my actual house. I called different numbers and tried to get them to come out and do something about their amount of people, the fact it's an illegal trailer park or even the fact that it is unlivable conditions with all the garbage. A health hazard would surely constitute the state to come and do something about it. Turns out I lived in a very tricky area though and everything was technically allowed except that they were on my property. Even the trash was considered okay because they were in the trash business or something so they would not come for that. They told me that if it was an issue of trespassing I needed to call the police who would tell me it was squatting and get me back to square one. I was going in circles and I did not know what to do at all. That was when I started noticing something from my bedroom window. We live in a three story house where me and my wife sleep on the top floor. I can see out my window and right over all of the RVs and tents into their backyard. I noticed that neighbor keeps coming out of his shed a lot holding things and handing them out to people. Then they will go to the fire and light it on fire. For those who are lucky enough to not know what was going on, they were not roasting marshmallows by the fire, they were doing drugs. Now this was something that I could use but I was going to need some evidence if I wanted to make the police actually do something about it. 
I was an active stargazer for a while and one of the things I wanted when I moved out here was the dark nights to see the stars. So that meant I had a pretty decent telescope in my garage that I was not using because of the RV lights ruining it. So I lucked it up the stairs and waited until I could see very up close what they were doing. Luckily for me, my telescope is high tech and can even take pictures. It was clear that it was drugs and it was even coming out of some of the RVs where it was also being made. I sent the pictures to the police and waited, knowing that they could not ignore it. Two days later, a ton of police show up at the house and there is total chaos. People are trying to get into the RVs and get away, but police blocked every possible exit for them, so they were totally stuck. At the end of a lot of confusion, I counted no less than 20 people being arrested, including the neighbor himself of course. Turns out, neighbor was cooking meth and the people in the RVs were either helping or were just the people buying off of them. Meth is one of the drugs that I guess is taken more seriously, I only know it from TV shows, so there was no way they could just get away with it. I still wish they would have gotten in trouble for the illegal trailer park, but this worked just as well. Turns out the operation was big enough that Neighbor was considered a major drug dealer and they went after him far more severely than everyone else. I don't know who they were so I could not follow their case, but the neighbors could and what I found out was amazing. He tried to go to court and use a defense that the police did not have the right to arrest him for cooking meth since they were doing it on his property. However, it was actually my property, but like I said, I'm the only one that cared about that. Obviously, that excuse did not really hold up in court and he was found guilty and sent to jail. With him gone, his property actually landed on the state to take care of and make sure it was good, so they came and cleaned it up and of course all evidence of the meth lab were gone. Now it looks like a normal yard and I was finally happy with my property and land. I could sleep at night without worry and I would go out and tend to my garden and chicken without the fear that a bunch of guys high on meth were trying to get into them. Honestly, I would not be surprised if they were trying to steal my chickens because they thought while they were high they could eat it or something. Anyway, that is the story of how I tried to get my neighbor arrested for trespassing on my property but ended up busting an entire meth ring. And Ripe Stars, I'm curious, did you ever come across any neighbors that were dealing or even making drugs in their own home? And if so, what did you do? Did you call the police? Let us know in the comments and while you're at it, I would really appreciate it if you could also like the video because that would help my channel tremendously. Thank you so much in advance, I really appreciate your amazing daily support. And now let's continue with the stories. The next one is titled Eviction Revenge. I'm the landlord of some apartments in the city. I sign the lease agreements and go over the basics with tenants, although they don't usually want me to spend hours delving into the fine print. 99% of the time it's a breeze and everything is fine. One lady, let's call her Karen, had been paying her rent via a new bank account and new checks for the last several months. All of a sudden, we got several chargeback fees on our account, she had put a stop payment on the checks and closed the account, I immediately called her. Me, hey Karen, it looks like your checks bounced for the last few months, I just wanted to make sure everything is okay. Karen, oh no, I promise I will get this fixed. Me, okay, you've been a good tenant in the past, so I will give you a month. Needless to say, a month passed and she did not pay. So I called her again. Me, hey Karen, we still have not received payment, so I'm afraid we will have to file for eviction. Karen, oh god no, I'm an old woman, I cannot afford to be evicted, I'm trying so hard to pay, can you give me another shot? Me, as long as you pay before the court date, the eviction doesn't have to go through. The court date arrives and guess who has not paid yet. At court, the judge rules for a 24 hour notice to vacate, Karen in tears comes up to me afterwards. Karen, can you please give me another chance, I cannot afford to go anywhere else. Me, I'm sorry Karen, but the only way I could do that is if you paid off the debt, signed a new lease agreement, plus a first month's rent, plus a new security deposit, and I don't think that's going to happen. Goodbye. So I left and I thought that was that. My maintenance guy would come in a few days to do the inspection and clean up and then we would put it on the market. 
He shows up a few days later and there is a problem. They are still there. So I call the sheriff to schedule a set out, a problem though. According to the sheriff, the 24 hour notice was no longer valid as we had struck up a deal afterwards so the court had reversed the eviction decision. I had no recollection of having decided that this would happen, I called the court and they informed me that the eviction was no longer valid as apparently I told the sheriff that I was giving her more time in validating the decision etc. What happened was that Karen had called the sheriff and told him that the court had reversed the decision because of a non-existent deal. She had then called the court and told them that the sheriff could not evict her as I had waived the notice and she had used my words twisting my denial of an extension into a deal. I tried to give her the benefit of the doubt, I sent Karen a copy of a new lease agreement asking for the debts in addition to rent for a first month and a new security deposit. Her lawyer then contacted me, yes she had the money to hire a lawyer somehow, informing me that in fact her old lease agreement was still valid as my deal, you know the one that would require a new lease agreement, invalidated the eviction decision. So I filed for eviction on the grounds that she had not paid for several months now, five to be exact and therefore had invalidated her old lease agreement. And then I read her old lease agreement, I already know these contracts pretty well but like I said I don't usually delve into the minutia, this time though I did. So we show up at court, Karen has her lawyer, Karen is bursting, grinning like a fool, like she has won the lottery. Her lawyer looks fairly happy as well, the judge asks me to speak. Me, I would like Karen to leave the apartments but she is refusing, despite the fact that according to the court's last decision she should have left over a month ago now. Judge and Miss Karen? Lawyer? Miss Karen cannot be ejected from her home without a new notice. Yes, she has not yet paid past due rent, however, she and the landlord struck up a deal, giving her the time she needed to pay via verbal agreement. This deal, made directly after the last court date, invalidated the last decision, so Miss Karen will require a new decision and therefore a new notice before she can rightfully be evicted from her home. Until then, her lease agreement is still valid. Insert other legal stuff, judge. And landlord, what do you have to say? Me, well, your honor, I have to agree. They have made a very, very compelling argument. Karen and I did indeed make a deal, giving her the time she needed to pay. And yes, her old lease agreement is still valid, I guess. Well, according to the terms of the still valid lease. There are some additional things that the court needs to be aware of that I would like to go over for clarification. I'm sure you have a copy, your honor. Judge, yes, I do. Me, and you have a copy, lawyer? Yes, I do. Me, excellent. Well, your honor, if you look at section 4, subsection A on page 2, you will see that after 10 days of non-payment, a late fee of $100 is applied. If you continue reading to subsection B, you will see that after 15 days of non-payment, additional late fees of $10 per day are applied until full payment is rendered. If you continue to subsection C, you will see that failed payments necessitate a chargeback fee of $50 per failed payment. If you will continue your honor to page 4 section 7 subsection F you will see that if a tenant is in any way responsible for a loss of rent including leaving an apartment in less than move in ready condition, failed payments or lastly refusal to vacate in the case of an eviction, the tenant is responsible for payment of said loss of rent in addition to any other debts owed. In addition, on page A, section 14, subsection A, you will note that the tenant is responsible for any and all legal fees resultant from the eviction process including attorney fees, such as for the attorney I hired to help me review this lease agreement. Finally, on page 10, the last page, section 17, subsection B, you will see that the tenant is responsible for all HVAC services rendered on their unit. As we sent in a company to fix the unit in Mrs. Karen's apartment at her request, we have the invoice here for the replacement unit in addition to the totals for all of the fees listed. At this point, the lawyer had gone completely pale. It's clear that he was more concerned that I would fight the whole deal thing than the terms of the lease he thought he would have to fight to keep valid. 
Karen looks utterly shell-shocked, her mouth slightly agape, like a child confused by a game of peekaboo. The judge, meanwhile, is completely unfazed, until I hand her the invoice alongside my math, a spreadsheet and a piece of paper with the total debt owed circled and highlighted at the bottom of the page. Her eyes widen to the size of her mouth as her jaw dropped with an audible gasp. Me? As you can see, your honor, the total owed is in excess of $16,000. I will happily accept the payment in the form of a cashier's check. I would hate to have to charge yet another $50 fee for failed payment, should another personal check bounce. Judge, lawyer, do you have anything to say? At this point, the lawyer looks like he is about to pass out. Karen seems to have stopped breathing, the judge remains silent for a moment and then collects herself. Judge, I'm afraid you will have to address that matter of debt in a different court than this one, landlord. We are here only to judge whether Miss Karen is to be evicted from her home today. Me? Oh, if she wants to stay, I would be happy to let her. As long as she agrees to continue to abide by the terms of the lease agreement, specifically those clauses outlined above. And pays the debt owed today. Judge, I'm going to rule for a 24-hour notice to vacate, unless Miss Karen can produce payment at this moment. Karen sits still, quiet, speechless even, her lawyer is eyeing the window. I like to think, contemplating his decisions in life, that led him to this point. Maybe thinking about jumping, I don't know. Hopefully not, by the way. Judge, right, a 24-hour notice to vacate. And landlord, me, yes. Judge, you will want to file those charges in small claims court, or a higher court if it exceeds the amount that you can legally pursue in small claims. Me, already filed, your honor. The case has now been resolved and needless to say, I got a fairly significant bonus in addition to a slight raise. The next one was posted by user Mayawood91 on our own subreddit r slash ripe stories and it is titled Fail to help me game the system? I will sue you. For context, this story was shared with me by an old colleague and I thought it might be appreciated here. I live on the west coast of Canada and in my province, like a state, there are two different levels of local government, regional districts and municipalities. Municipalities can be urban cities or suburban towns, some are even small villages. They all have elected councils and typically have community services such as municipal sewage, water, etc. Regional districts are a little different. In rural areas with very low population densities that don't have municipal councils, a regional district governs the land. These districts are often very large with respect to size and may have many different electoral areas. They often have less service, smaller governments and less taxes, but some regional districts are in areas areas where things have become more urban over time and slowly portion of their land base has converted into municipalities. In this scenario, the regional district still maintains service for rural areas outside of the municipalities, but the municipalities are largely responsible for services in their areas. The regional government becomes more of a body to help the various towns and cities coordinate services that benefit from a regional perspective and the regional board members mostly consist of appointees from the various municipal governments. Now the background. Both regional districts and municipalities have authority to zone land. Some zones are business zones, some are residential and some allow for many dwellings, some only allow for one. In cities there is huge pressure to grow as the land is near to services and amenities, but the rural lands are often a lot cheaper to purchase and develop. If left without regulation, the basic land economics create rapid urbanization and development in rural areas that are poorly serviced with community services and amenities and results in spall with poor infrastructure and lots of residents commuting to urban centers for work. To avoid this sprawl, regional districts were created in the mid-1960s to help ensure growth is largely contained to urban centers and rural lands can meet their basic needs like water, sewage, zoning, etc. And now the setup. A land developer who was in the industry for some 50 plus years decided in the early 2000s that a recreational property he purchased for his family should be developed. 
That property is located in a rural area, regional district, but is within maybe a 20 minute commute to a city that has nearly tripled in size over the past 30 years. The property itself is on the shore of a popular lake and the developer, let's call him Bob, figured he could turn the one property into 11 lakeshore lots and pocket a million dollars. The cast is Bob, the developer and landowner, then there is Kevin, Bob's consultant and the regional district, the district. The story, while Bob wanted to subdivide his property into 11 lots, he knew that the district would block that application unless he was successful in changing the land zoning to one that would allow for a higher density of residential development. Bob had made some contacts during his time as a developer and decided to enlist Kevin, who was formerly a town planner who worked with the district, but decided to quit his government job and open up his own consulting business because he figured he could make more money. Over the years, Bob had played with the idea of selling land to the provincial, like a state, government so that it could be made into a park and in exchange he would pocket some money and obtain property owned by the province that is in an area more suited to develop, which would mean bringing in far more money for him. Unfortunately for Bob, the province was not buying into his scheme so he enlisted Kevin to help develop the lakefront property. Bob figured that he and Kevin could look to develop the land and make a decent profit. But that since the project would be controversial, the province may decide to buy the land and do the land swap for political reasons. Bob figured that the closer they got to developing the land, the more it would be valued at. In the early 2000s, Kevin started his work and attempted to change the zoning for the lakefront property. The district responded negatively to these plans and after four years of attempts, Bob was told that the district was not going to support this project. Which is government speak for, stop wasting our time. Bob and Kevin moved on to other projects and did okay for themselves working together over the next five years. However, things changed in 2010. Bob decided that he would do some work on the lakefront property to build a cabin and make it a destination for his family during the summers. Bob failed to obtain permits from the district and this was considered newsworthy in the town. Bob was confused because the news article said his property was zoned for a higher residential density, the zone that the district explained it would not support five years ago. After reading the article, Bob asked Kevin to look into options to develop the land. Bob and Kevin figured that the article simply had an error, but after Kevin went to do some investigation, they realized that the district records indicated that Bob's property was zoned for an 11 lot subdivision. Both Bob and Kevin had no idea how or when the property was rezoned by the district, but they were aware that if the property was zoned for development by mistake, the district could take swift action to downzone the property and put it back into its original designation, which did not allow for development. Kevin took two years to covertly investigate the zoning as they did not want to risk the district correcting the error. Kevin never asked outright why and how was Bob's land rezoned, but through his work he discovered that the land was indeed zoned for development, but strongly suspected that this was an error because the zoning did not simply allow for the 11 lots that Bob assumed they could develop, but it also allowed for a 100 plus apartment in a rural area without sufficient access to a community water or sewer system. Bob decided to start the development process which would first involve environmental permits from the district for the 100 plus unit apartment complex. Problems hit the fan at the district office when Bob's application was delivered and the district staff knew something was wrong. They immediately initiated their own investigation and realized that Bob's property had been mistakenly entered into a database as a development zone and that error had come official in 2007 when the district updated its zoning regulations and accidentally placed Bob's property into a development zone. The district immediately looked into options to downzone the property and eliminate its ability to be subdivided into 11 lots or developed into a 100 plus unit apartment. The district staff reached out to Bob and Kevin to let them know that the property would be returned to its rural zone as the process to do this would take several meetings. During the downzoning process, Bob and Kevin hatched a plan and applied to the province to obtain subdivision approvals. 
There is a provincial statute which states that if an application is made to develop a property, a local government cannot prevent that development by downzoning the land. This is a good rule and it's put in place to stop government officials from abusing their position and killing development projects which are permitted, which may have had tens of thousands of dollars invested in engineering and site preparation works. The folks who wrote this provincial statute did not anticipate a situation like Bob's. The district reached out to the province to explain the situation and pointed out that the land should not be developed due to the clerical error and that the district had downzoned the property. The province refused to kill the project and gave Bob preliminary approval, a list of conditions he would need to meet in order to develop the 100 plus unit apartment. The province explained that because the lands were downzoned, the clock is ticking and Bob only had one year to complete the process. If the works were not done in a year, the development would fail. Bob and Kevin quickly realized that they would not be able to meet the conditions for the 100 plus unit apartment in a year and updated their application to be for the 11 lot subdivision. The district opposed this but the province explained that Bob was within his legal rights and accepted the updates. Bob's revised list of requirements was much more reasonable and could probably be done before the one year window was closed. During this time the value of lakefront property had increased significantly and Bob realized he could probably sell the 11 lots for $500,000 plus each. Bob and Kevin worked on the requirements and negotiated with the province to eliminate the need for a public boat launch so that the lots could be as large as possible. Eventually only one requirement remained with six months left on the clock. However, that requirement was one that the district would need to sign off on. Bob and Kevin anticipated a fight with the district but were surprised to find them helpful. The district had, behind the scenes, worked with their lawyers to look at every option to kill Bob's project but found that none existed so they would reluctantly work with Bob. Here in my province when property is subdivided there is a rule that states the local government can take 5% of the land as public park or an equivalent cash payment for 5% of the land from the developer that can be used to purchase parks. In some cases cash is preferred as there is no desirable parkland and that cash eventually adds up and is used to purchase large swaths of parkland. Bob and Kevin entered discussions with the district to see if they could agree on a valuation of the 5% cash payment in lieu of providing a portion of the land as park. And this is where the district got clever. They pointed out that there were very little public parks around the lake and given this the district would not accept cash in lieu and demanded that 5% of the land be provided as park land. Bob and Kevin were annoyed but redrafted their plans to provide a 5% portion of the land for park purposes. They intentionally picked the worst parts of the property that were not suitable for a park and subject to flooding, erosion etc. The district did not accept the plans and explained that they would only accept a park with at least 20 meters of lake access so that a public beach and parking lot could be created. This was not an unreasonable request, however the implication is that one of Bob's 11 lots would be dedicated as a part and Bob did not find this to be an acceptable solution. Over the next 6 months Bob and Kevin attempted to negotiate but were not successful. Bob and Kevin got greedy and fought with the district until their one year clock ran out. Once the one year grace period for approving the 11 lot subdivision expired, the land could not be developed. Bob appealed to the province and was told, tough luck, you finished 99% of the requirements but have been dragging your feet on this park issue. Your application is expired. In hindsight, Bob should have simply agreed to the park requirements as he would still have 10 lots which after his costs would probably fetch an easy 4.5 million dollars but no, Bob wanted to make it an even 5 million. Bob's property was now back to its rural zoning and estimated to be worth 600,000 dollars. Rather than admit defeat and learn from the experience, Bob decided that he would sue the district and alleged all sorts of conspiracy theories that this was a plot by the government to swindle him out of tens of thousands of dollars and devalue his property. The court case took 5 years and was appealed several times until it reached its last appeal. Bob demanded that the district compensate his losses with interest and the district pointed out that it was willing to live with their mistake and would have approved a subdivision if acceptable parkland was provided. 
They also implored the judge to consider the fact that the lands were only zoned for development by a clerical error. Bob explained that the zoning error had directly impacted the value of his lands and resulted in investments to develop the property. Bob explained that the zoning error had cost him and the solution would be to allow his development or to pay him. The judge had a few critical questions. Judge, Kevin, did you ever question why and how the property was rezoned? Kevin, no. Bob, your honor, we relied on the general zoning information on the district's website. Judge, is the reason why you never made express and direct inquiries to the district because you were concerned the property would be downzoned? Bob, of course. Judge, you knew developing this property was high risk given these circumstances? Bob, yes, but I'm out of money now. Judge, your claim is dismissed. You made a risky investment in development and it did not work out. Bob did not win his case and Bob's land is currently sitting vacant. And ripe stars, with this we have reached the end of the video. However, if you still cannot get enough of my content, then I would highly suggest to check out my endless binge watch playlist, which will soon show up in the left corner of the screen. In addition, I would really appreciate it if you could not only subscribe to the channel, but also turn on the bell notifications, which you can do by clicking on the little bell icon right next to the subscribe button. This will help my channel tremendously and this will make sure that you don't miss any of my videos. Furthermore, if you want to see additional ripe content that I don't post on YouTube, then I would suggest to head on over to patreon.com slash ripe YouTube for more than 50 exclusive videos that you will not see anywhere else. Thank you so much for your amazing daily support and I hope to see you again tomorrow.